much. I'd like to welcome everybody today. Uh, I know that you're all very, very busy professionals, and I want to be respectful of your time and just let you know that I appreciate you being willing to give me some of your time today to talk about the BASC-3 model of assessment intervention and how it relates to ADHD specifically. As we begin, you should all be aware that I am an author of the BASC-3 and uh, was the originator of the BASC-3 back uh, actually in the 1980s, well, the original BASC back in, in the 1980s. And that means that, that, that all things BASC are my baby. So remember that everybody thinks their baby's pretty whether it is or not, and I'm probably going to say nice things about it today. So ultimately, you'll have to be the judge. I will try to be as objective as possible, but it's my baby, and I think it's pretty. So with that, we're going to get going. I'm going to move through this pretty quickly today because there is a lot of material to cover, and we do only have 90 minutes, and I know that sounds like a long time, but it's a lot of stuff. So let's get going. And at the end, I know there will be questions I won't be able to get to. We are going to get a summary of questions after the workshop, too, that will be responded to, and Pearson will make the responses to those available to everybody. So questions we don't get to, we will do follow-up later. So the first order of business, is ADHD real or is it a made-up disorder? I always feel compelled to mention that issue because you see so much on the web in particular about ADHD not being a real issue, that it's something that Big Pharma made up, and they did it so that they could make money off selling drugs. Well, it turns out long before Big Pharma, back in 1865, Heinrich Hoffmann in Germany published a story of a young man which translated to fidgety Phil. And it's a good description of children with ADHD, although he didn't name it anything. But he wrote this story after having dinner with a family of friends who had a young son. And it's a perfect description, as it turns out, of a child with ADHD. It was not until 1902, though, that Dr. Steele and Treadgold published a study describing 43 children in their clinical practice with serious problems with sustained attention and impulse control, and at that time they said it has about a three-to-one ratio, which was a remarkably present because that's about what it remains. Still believed this was a disorder of moral development, and that's a notion that remained with us until the late 1950s, and I will occasionally see that today. Sometimes people say, well, it's just a matter of these children needing better discipline or it's a matter of their character or they just need to pay better attention. Well, actually they do, but that's not all and they can't do it on their own. ADHD has been with us in the literature for over 150 years. The fact is that ADHD is a neurobiological disorder. Many of the myths around it are that kids are hyperactive just because their parents don't make them behave, and occasionally that's true, but not most of the time. Or that teachers just want children medicated so they don't have to do their job. Well, if you have an ADHD class, uh, a kid in your class, you do need help, and the kids need help too. Or that hyperactivity is just boys being boys because more boys have the primarily hyperactive type. But these boys are outside the norm. Or that ADHD was created by doctors and drug companies to enhance their business. Or that it's just an excuse not to do work at school. Or they're just lazy. So there's lots of myths out there that surround ADHD. But the truth is, that ADHD is a neurobiological disorder that is now well documented from studies of brain structure, brain function, and the neurochemistry of the brain. It can also be a lifelong disorder. The data work out to show that of the children diagnosed with ADHD in the early developmental period, about a third of those will, will in fact age out after puberty. And about another third will age out between the ages of about 20 
and 25. But for about 35% of persons diagnosed with ADHD, it's a lifelong disorder. The aging out is most likely due to developmental changes in the brain. It doesn't mean they didn't have it. It means that the brain structures and chemistry responsible for causing it did, in fact, improve. So ADHD is real. It's a disorder of self-regulation due to hypoactivity of key communication circuitry in and between the frontal regions of the brain and the limbic and posterior portions of the brain. These are very important dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline pathways, especially. It's also, on average, associated with hypodensity of the prefrontal region on average. This, by the way, is not a good way to diagnose ADHD because these are group averages, but they show up consistently across studies. In my book on ADHD entitled The Energetic Brain, I've characterized ADHD as like having a Ferrari brain but with bicycle brakes. But it need not be limiting, and we can manage ADHD effectively at all ages. I would note that in 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics released a report on diagnosis of ADHD by pediatricians. They did this to give guidance around it because it is such a controversial disorder. And I want to point out some of the things that they had to say because they should apply to all of us and not just pediatricians. And in fact, you'll see, as I discuss their report, that we are much more likely to do this than pediatricians anyway. So. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommended that the assessment of ADHD include information obtained directly from parents or caregivers, as well as a classroom teacher and other school professionals. And that this information cover the core symptoms of ADHD in various settings. So we need to know what kids are like, not just at school, but in other places in their life. ADHD is not a school-specific disorder. We need to know when it started, how long it's been going on, and how are they impaired by this. So the evaluation of ADHD should also include assessment for coexisting conditions. The most common are learning and language problems, aggression, disruptive behavior, depression, and anxiety. And they indicated back in 2000 that about one in three children diagnosed with ADHD have a coexisting or comorbid condition. Current estimates are that it's closer to 50%. That means that broadband assessment is necessary for accurate diagnosis. And that's really crucial because there are many mimics for ADHD out there. And narrow band scales tend to overdiagnose. Most of the time, if you use a test or a scale with a disorder's name in it, you'll get to diagnose that disorder. So those, those narrowband scales are particularly good for follow-up and looking at treatment effects and change over time. But for initial diagnosis, we need broadband assessment. Mimics are common. For example, the incidence of boys with depression who are misdiagnosed as ADHD is quite significant. We can avoid making those misdiagnoses by using broadband scales that not only cover all of the symptoms of ADHD, but also cover depression, anxiety, PTSD-related symptoms, issues like that. Comorbidities are common as well. So we need to know if a child has something else along with their ADHD. Behaviors may be specific to a single setting. So we need information of cross-setting so we can triangulate. So what that means is that we need to know the pervasiveness of the behavior. If it only occurs in one teacher's classroom, it's not ADHD. If it only occurs with mom and never with dad, it's probably not ADHD. So we need to have a full set of information. 
Secondary and other comorbidities should also influence choices and sequences of treatments. Sometimes it's better to treat depression first and then treat ADHD if you happen to have a child with both diagnoses. The recommendations that they made apply not just to ADHD, uh, but uh, and not just to DSM, but also to kids who are emotionally disturbed under IDEIA. That requires that we look broadly at children, the context of their behavior, and how long it's been happening. You will all be familiar with the federal definition of emotional disturbance, a condition exhibiting one or more of the following over a long period of time to a marked degree that adversely affects the child's educational performance. The primary criteria, actually, that ADHD kids will meet, and some of them do meet criteria for being ED, some OHI, some don't meet special education criteria at all, some are only going to require 504 plans. And this is probably a good place to talk about this for just a minute. I get asked at times, well, where should ADHD kids be served in the school? Should they be served as emotionally disturbed? Should they be served as 504? Should they be served, if they're in special ed, as OHI or as ED or what? And my answer is not a popular one, but I think it's the best one. And that is one child at a time. Some children with ADHD are best served in special ed under ED. Some are best served as OHI. Some are best served outside of special ed in 504 plans. It depends on the specific child and the specific symptoms that they display and the severity of them. So one child at a time is how we should make those decisions. But kids with ADHD who do qualify under ED will primarily qualify because they have an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers, and because they may also have inappropriate types of behavior or feelings under normal circumstances. So we have to look at them one child at a time. It's also important to understand the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD if you're going to be diagnosing it. And the key to treatment first is to get the diagnosis right. So the DSM-5 gives us the diagnostic criteria that tells us that ADHD represents a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity that interferes with functioning or development characterized by both or one area of inattention or hyperactivity and impulsivity. Under inattention, you must have a child who displays six or more symptoms. The symptoms listed uh, for inattention in the DSM, by the way, are examples. They are not every symptom of inattention that could possibly exist. Hyperactivity and impulsivity. Again, six or more symptoms that have persisted for at least six months, inconsistent with developmental level that negatively impact the child. Now, I want to point out a couple of other things in those narratives. One is a significant change. They now say that the behavior is inconsistent with developmental level. Previously, that was not a condition for diagnosis of ADHD. The child's developmental level was not considered. And that's a significant change because what that might mean, for example, is let's suppose you have two nine-year-olds with similar symptoms and they have symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity. And let's suppose that one of the nine-year-olds also has a diagnosis of intellectual disability. And their behavior, their level of attention, their activity and impulsivity levels are consistent with that, say, of a child of only six years old. They may not 
have ADHD. They may simply be behaving like a six-year-old, even though they're nine. But the other nine-year-old perhaps has a much higher IQ, may have an IQ of 125, 130. And that child may have the same symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. But compared to their developmental level, they do experience a pattern of behavior that is consistent with ADHD. So now we have to consider developmental level. I think that makes a lot more sense and have been arguing for that for decades. But the field has been very resistant. But now we do have this change about inconsistently with developmental level. We also have a greater emphasis throughout DSM-5, not just in the category of ADHD, but throughout the DSM-5 on functional impairment with this sentence that it negatively impacts directly on social and academic or occupational activities. And you'll see a lot more of that in DSM-5 than you saw in previous editions, although functional impairment has always been a criteria for diagnosis. In attention examples they give in the DSM-5, things like failing to give attention to details, making careless mistakes, problems sustaining attention, uh, losing things, being forgetful. And these are examples. It's important to remember that. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many ways children can show their inattention. The same occurs with hyperactivity and impulsivity. They give us examples, fidgety feel, fidgeting and squirming, leaving their seat when being seated is expected, running about, unable to play or be in leisure quietly, excessive talking, um, on the go or act as if driven by a motor. That particular phrase is taken from so many descriptions given by parents who will tell us that their child acts like they're being driven by a motor. I don't know how many parents I've had actually say that too. So again, these are examples from the DSM. Children have many ways to show us their hyperactivity and their impulsivity. So don't think if it's not on this list, it can't be used to support a diagnosis. It can. There are additional criteria required for a diagnosis of ADHD in the DSM. At least two symptoms of inattention or hyperactivity or impulsivity must have been present prior to the age of 12. That's a significant change from the DSM-4 uh, as well as three, which set a much younger cutoff for that. At least two symptoms are present in more than one setting. So again, the idea that ADHD is a pervasive disorder, if it only happens in very specific situations, it's not ADHD. Clear evidence that it interferes with social, academic, or occupational function, functioning, again, emphasizing functional impairment. The symptoms don't appear during a psychotic disorder only and are not better explained by another mental disorder. For example, a child with PTSD, particularly a younger child, may very well give the appearance on the surface of having severe ADHD when in fact the underlying driver is anxiety. It could be in an adolescent that it's a substance abuse disorder. One of the things that we do see with folks who begin abusing substances, particularly early, is that they can look on the surface very much like a person with ADHD, but it's not. It's their pattern of substance use that gives them that appearance. So these rule outs are really crucial to getting the diagnosis right in part because treatment is diagnosis-driven. Not every disorder is best treated with the same intervention, so we've got to get the diagnosis right to know which interventions are the most appropriate ones. Common associated features of ADHD is the DSM instructions are mild delays in learning, language, social, and motor development, 
And it's interesting that there's actually quite a bit more research published in Europe about motor development issues in ADHD. Uh, it's interesting on uh, actual measurements of things like gait, gait disturbance, balance, things like that, that these kids on average show mild levels of impairment. And they're things that we commonly do not assess here. But this research has really come forward quite a bit over the last decade. Work performance is impaired in multiple settings. They don't do well on laboratory tests of attention, memory, and executive function. And one of the things that we know is when you have a child with an appropriate diagnosis of ADHD, if it is comorbid with a mood disorder, conduct disorder, or substance use disorder, suicide risk is elevated. It doesn't mean it's imminent. It doesn't mean that they are going to commit suicide or that most of the kids who meet this criteria are suicidal. It only means risk is elevated and is something else to pay attention to in following these children. So the BAS-3, I will introduce you to that just a little bit to our model. And maybe it's not an introduction, but more of a refresher for you. Remember that BAS-3 is a multidimensional, multi-method approach to assessing child and adolescent emotional and behavioral disorders. The original BASC model still applies to BAS-3. In that, we develop our little pie chart to demonstrate the dimensions that we think are imperative to evaluate with any disorder, but certainly with ADHD. The first is history. And history is crucial. As we learn from the AAP and the DSM, we need to know when this started, where it occurs, how long it's been going on. We also need to know other things about the child's background. Is there trauma in this child's history? What's the family history? Are there other family members with ADHD or characteristics of it? It is primarily inherited. Uh, the risk of ADHD um, in a family where there is a father or grandfather with a diagnosis goes up substantially. So it's also important to understand through the history the context of the child's life. If you are in an extremely chaotic environment and one that is also high stress, we may need to dig even deeper to be sure that what we're seeing is ADHD and not something else. Sometimes it can even be an adaptive response to such chaotic and stressful environments. So I always like to add to the word history and context. You have to know the context of the child's life to get any diagnosis right, and ADHD is no exception. For that, we provide a structured developmental history that allows you to get a structured survey of the child's history and the current context of their life. This can be done um, by most parents who have an eighth grade education or higher. They can fill this out on their own, and they can do it using the paper and pencil version. They can also do it using the digital version. And then you can review that and ask them follow-up questions. If you have a parent who has difficulty completing that, we also have designed it in such a way that you can use it as a structured interview. When you take a history and query parents about the context of the child's life, I want to encourage you to always have a cheat sheet, and that's what the structured developmental history is in such an interview. Because if you don't have something to guide you, I don't care how many of these you've done, and I have literally done thousands of history and clinical interviews with parents. If you don't have something to guide you, you will forget to ask something. You will forget some important follow-up. We're just not that good, none of us, at doing that without something to give us some guidance, no matter how many we've done. So you can use the structured developmental history in multiple ways. 
If you don't like ours, I can't imagine why you wouldn't. But if you don't, uh, find one you like. Find one that's comprehensive and thorough and that you're comfortable working with, and it'll improve your skills in that area and improve your practice. The next piece of our chart is actual behavior. And that is also a major, major piece of this. We named it the Behavioral Assessment System for Children, right? So we really want to focus on the behaviors that, child, that, that children show us. And we want to do that using multiple methods from multiple perspectives. So we want to know how they are at home. How do they relate to their parents at home and in other settings away from school with the parent? What do they see? And how are they at school? Children spend more structured time at school than in any other setting throughout their developmental years, between the ages of birth and 18, certainly, and some on up to 22, the most structured time in their life is spent in the presence of a teacher. So it's important to know how they see kids. So we want those ratings of their behavior. And it turns out that behavior ratings are highly reliable and not as subjective as some people uh, would argue. They do give us reliable scores, and we can count on the expertise that, that people have with a student or with their child to be related to us in those rating scales. But we also believe that it's important to lay eyes on the child in the classroom. So we have a direct observation scale known as the SOS, the Student Observation Scales, where you can go in, and it uses a time sampling procedure, and it's really old school. 60s behavioral assessment where you go in and you actually count behaviors, whereas omnibus rating scales like the teacher rating scale and the parent rating scale are in fact impressionistic. We don't ask parents and teachers to count behaviors, but sometimes that's useful to us, and we can use the SOS. It requires 15 minutes of your time for each child you observe, and it gives us actual count. The next big piece of our pie is looking at the child's emotions and self-perceptions. For that, we have a self-report of personality. Um, here we ask the child to tell us, how do you think and feel about yourself and about your interactions with other people and your world? And that's important to understanding the child's feelings about their behavior and the child's feelings about other people and how they relate to them. And that is something, too, that's absolutely crucial to getting interventions correct along with the diagnosis. So that's our fundamental model. Our diagnostic components, and all of these are available via, via paper and pencil as well as on QGlobal or in some digital format. Everything except the TRS are available in English and in Spanish. And we did do a lot of uh, special work with the Spanish forms, by the way, to equate them to the English forms. And there's a lot of discussion about that in the manual. We don't have time to talk about developing the Spanish language forms today. But they are a complete redevelopment of the English language scales, and the norms have been perfectly equated from English to Spanish. And I can elaborate on that. Uh, if you take a look at the manual and any of you have questions about that, email me. I have much more material on how that happened. But anyway, the structured developmental history is available for all ages. Um, the student observation system is useful at all ages as well, and it can be applied in any setting that has educational goals, I should say any structured setting that has educational goals, the observation system works. The self-report of personality comes in four versions. We have an interview version, and it had the biggest changes, by the way, from BAS 2 to BAS 3. And this is where you read the questions, you interview the child using 
the self-report of personality, and ask follow-up questions. Then we have the child version for ages 8 to 11, which is entirely self-report. They do it themselves. The adolescent version for 12 to 21. And then we have a college version, if you work with college kids, that's normed from ages 18 to 25, and the norms are by level of uh, educational experience at that point. Where are they in their college career? With the SRP, I want to point out one thing that's different about the norms for ages 19, 20, and 21. And this is true for all BAS components. The 19, 20, and 21-year-old 20, norms are based on adolescents who are still in school at that age. Up through 18, the standardization samples for all things BASC are population proportionate stratified random samples of children, of children attending public and private schools in the United States. For 19, 20, and 21, it is still a random sample, but only of children attending school. So if you're seeing a 20-year-old outside of the schools who is not attending school, then BASC would not have appropriate norms for you. Uh, but if they're still in school, the norms are appropriate. The parent rating scale uh, starts at age two, as does the teacher. Two to five for the preschool, six to 11 for the child, 12 to 21 for the adolescent. Uh, same, uh, we parallel that with the teacher form. And then we have the parenting relationship questionnaire for ages two to 18, which by the way is normed by the age of the child, not the parent. This is an, an addition that came about with BAS-2, which is a form the parent completes to tell us about their relationship with their child and what they think the child would say about some aspects of their relationship. So it gives us a different perspective on actual relationships. And it looks at things like attachment, parenting confidence, um, disciplinary practices within the home, uh, how well the parent communicates with their child and how well the child communicates with them. So uh, we have a number of scales on here related to how parents relate to their children and vice versa. So we think that is particularly important in getting to the right intervention. So let me talk next about choosing the right norms for ADHD because there are some conflicting recommendations in the literature. And I do get this question often, uh, is gosh, what norms should I use? And we get that question because BASC, BASC II and BASC III have always given you choices. We have normative tables that are divided by sex, male and female. So you can use single sex norms. You can use combined gender norms. The combined gender norms are all children put together. We also have norms with kids who just have ADHD. We also have general clinical norms. And all of these norms are also available as combined gender and same sex. They're all also divided by age level. So with this many choices, what do you use? And of course, the answer is, what questions are you trying to answer about a child? Because norms are simply reference groups that answer questions for us about kids. <clears throat> norms are commonly misunderstood in other ways, but they really are reference groups, and I wish we'd rename them as that. When we get a score, a raw score from any test in psychology, not just behavior rating scales, but even an IQ or an achievement measure, we have to take that raw score and refer it to the performance of some group. And we talk about that as the standardization sample. Well, it's really our normative group. And we move that score over, compare it to how this particular reference group responded and that allows us to convert it to some kind of standardized score. But the reference group we choose determines what question we're answering. 
to give you an example uh, with achievement tests, because this question comes up a lot on some of the professional listservs. People want to know, gosh, with a the kid who's been retained, uh, should I look at age norms or grade norms for their achievement test? And the answer is, well, what question are you trying to answer? You can look at either or you can look at both. Grade norms answer the question, how does Johnny's achievement level compare to other children in the same grade? Age norms answer, simply answer a different question. How does Johnny's achievement level compare to that of other children the same age as Johnny? So when you ask, which norm should I use, first you should ask, what question am I trying to answer? And once you know the question you're trying to answer, then you know which norm groups are the most appropriate ones to use. The same is true in behavioral assessment. If I want to know how Johnny's behavior compares to that of all other children the same age, to combine gender norms at his age level are the appropriate ones to use. If I want, want to answer the question, how does Johnny, Johnny's behavior compare just to that of other boys at his age, I can use just the boy norms. If I want to know how his behavior compares to other children with a diagnosis of ADHD, then I can use the ADHD norms. So different reference groups answer different questions. And BAS-3 gives you the ability to answer some or all of those questions by using different reference groups. So to further that, the general national norms, which are the combined gender norms, does Rob have problems with depression relative to other children his age? Sex-based norms, how does Michelle's hyperactivity compare to that of other girls? The clinical norms would answer a question like, how severe is Natalie's psychoticism in comparison to other children diagnosed with mental health disorders of childhood? The ADHD norms, how severe are Kent's symptoms of depression in comparison to other children diagnosed with ADHD? So, I could take Rob's scores and basically, changing over to Rob's name, answer all of these questions about Rob. So how I would interpret those scores depends upon which norm group I'm looking at as I derive each of those scores. And the computerized scoring for BAS-3 will allow you to answer those questions all basically in the same computer scoring. So we also wonder why we need norms sometimes, and as I said, it's a matter of scaling. Uh, we only have interval scales in psychology, so we need to know about the relative frequency of scores. And in clinical assessment, even though we don't like the term normality, it becomes important to us to look at what's within a certain range and what falls outside of that range. So we know that there are gender differences on measures of behavior, feeling, and affect, and these abound across age, and no matter who's doing the reporting, if it's teachers, if it's parents, or self-reports. So let's take a quick look at some of these gender differences because it sometimes affects the decisions people make about which norms they want to use. So if we were to look at BAS-3 teacher ratings as a function of gender. We would see a plot like this where if you see a point that is above this center line that's marked as zero, if the point is above that line, it means that females have higher scores. If it's below that line, it means that males have higher scores. So you can see there are a lot of gender differences. Some of them are pretty substantial. You can see, for example, that boys, and I hope this is no surprise, at school are substantially more hyperactive, aggressive, and have more conduct problems than girls. Girls tend to be more anxious than boys. And this is a switch, by the way, that uh, we've seen happening over the last 10 to 15 years. For decades, girls showed more symptoms of depression 
that's becoming more common now among boys. Girls still have more somatization problems, somatization being an anxiety disorder, um, actually. And so they do have more internalizing problems. But guys, uh, for some of the men who are on the line, remember we own attention problems too. We have way more attention problems. We have more learning problems, more problems at school. Our atypicality scores are higher. Uh, and so we're a little more strange than the girls. We're a little more withdrawn. We don't, we're not quite as social as the girls. So you can see overall the boys have a lot more behavior problems. Uh, we see that also on the adapted scales. We see that girls have better scores on positive dimensions. They're more adaptable. They have better social skills, better leadership skills. They have better study skills. They communicate better and have better adaptive skills overall. And guys, then here we are with problems controlling our anger. We're more likely to be a bully. We have way more symptoms of developmental social disorder. Our emotional self-control is not as good on average until we get to our teen years. Uh, and then, again, that's relative to girls. I'm not saying teenagers have good emotional control. Remember, this is uh, relative to others the same age. Our executive function is not nearly as good as that of the girls at that age, and we tend to be more negative. Girls, on average, are seen as being much more resilient than boys. So that's all from the teacher's perspective, and their diagnostic probability in, uh, indexes reflect that. So boys are more likely to have a clinical disorder. We're more likely to be functionally impaired. And, boy, look at our ADHD probability index, particularly as adolescents. So we're also more likely to be autistic. So all that's consistent with the research literature. We will see that, too, with parent ratings. And I'm not going to take you through these one scale at a time, but um, the differences uh, are minimal. Uh, teachers tend to see uh, more larger differences, but the patterns are relatively consistent uh, across parents and teachers. So it doesn't matter who's rating the boys and girls, the differences are essentially the same. Uh, and that's across the board, even with the clinical diagnostic indexes. The self-report of personality parallels this as well. Here we see, for example, boys don't like school as much, we don't like our teachers as much, and we own sensation uh, we really, uh We really own that one. And we just have a lot more school problems. We rate ourselves as being more atypical. Uh, girls, on the other hand, uh, and this varies more as a function of age, but uh, older girls tend to feel like they have better locus of control, but they also feel a lot more stress and anxiety. The depression picture shifts uh, at the older ages by self-reporting on into college where now girls are more depression. Uh, so you see a lot of changes um, uh, happening, and some of these are a function of age, but a lot of consistency, somatization. Uh, guys, we still admit to and recognize our attention problems. We're still more hyperactive as we self-report. Uh, and when, when we get to college, we're going to outdrink the girls. So a lot of this is very consistent with what other people say about us. It's also true on the adaptive scales and the content scales. These parallel what we see pretty much uh, with the rating data. So there are a lot of differences. If we then go and use homogeneous gender norms, this has the function of equating males and females on all variables. And the question we have to ask is this, does this reflect reality when we're making a diagnosis. So the question comes down to this. Are boys and girls really different in how they think, feel, and behave? If they are, and this is counterintuitive to a lot of people, if boys and girls really are different, they should use, then we should use combined gender norms to preserve these differences. We don't want to wipe them out. 
if girls as a group are, in fact, experiencing more anxiety than boys, we don't want to equate the two groups. We want to diagnose more girls with anxiety disorders than we do boys because that reflects reality. But if you believe that the differences are artifacts of measurement bias, if you think, no, boys are not more hyperactive than girls, no, boys don't have more attention problems than girls, they just kind of look like they do on the surface and we're not measuring it accurately. Or you think that girls are not more anxious than boys, that it's just people seem to notice it more. Then we can correct that bias by using homogeneous gender norms because it removes all observed differences and equates boys and girls. Well, my view is that Boys and girls are different. Boys and girls really do behave differently. They think differently about their behaviors and feelings and act on that differently. So for diagnostic purposes, we want to use combined gender norms to get it right. What happens when we equate boys and girls? It turns out we're very likely to deny treatment to people who need it. Take, for example, girls with anxiety, boys with externalizing disorders. We can look at this question as well, and this is really a crucial question if we want to make it specific to something like inattention just to illustrate it. If you have a boy and a girl with the same number of attention issues, is the girl more adversely affected by that than the boy? If the girl is more adversely affected by that than the boy, then using female-only norms would be more likely to tell us that. But it turns out the research literature says that that's not true, that boys and girls are equally adversely affected at the same level of attention problems. Boys and girls are equally adversely affected at the same level of anxiety symptoms, at the same level of depression symptoms, at the same level of hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms. So because there's not a differential adverse effect, we do not want to equate boys and girls by using same-sex norms. We don't want to excuse behavior because of gender. Oh, of course she's anxious. She's a girl. Oh, of course he's hyperactive. He's a boy. Well, if it interferes with their life, it interferes with their life. And we need to make the diagnosis and treat them. And to get that right, we use combined gender norms. Think for a moment about the condition if judges simply used homogeneous gender norms for sentencing. And an example that I like to use is uh, suppose you go down to your courthouse and you want to watch justice in action. And a man is up for sentencing and he's pled guilty to an armed robbery. He knocked off a local gas station with a gun. And the judge asks if anyone has anything to say before sentencing, and the defense lawyer explains to the judge the normative data. He says, Your Honor, I need to point out that 98% of armed robberies in the United States are committed by men, and my client's a man. I, you know, it's just what men do. And the judge says, Well, I never thought about it like that, so he's not so bad. Maybe he's not so bad as I thought. So I'm going to sentence him to 20 years suspended and give him 20 years of probation. And as luck would have it, the next case is called, and it's a woman who's charged with an armed robbery. And before sentencing, the prosecutor jumps up and says, Your Honor, I feel compelled to point out to you that 98% of armed robberies are committed by men and only 2% are committed by women. So think how horrible this woman must be if she's committing an armed robbery. 
And the judge says, well, you're right. I hadn't thought about it using that kind of normative base. She must really be bad. And he gives her 40 years in prison. So those kinds of adjustments don't make sense based on things like gender. We should be looking at the actual behavior and the effects of those behaviors. Just remember that the use of homogeneous gender norms will deny identification and treatment disorder to cross gender for groups with higher prevalence rates and yield unnecessary diagnoses and treatment on those with lower prevalence rates. And when we are sending someone for help, we want to be sure we get it right. I don't think this is what Timmy had in mind when he sent Lassie for help. So let's be sure we get people to the right place. So let's look specifically at what happens if we use homogeneous versus heterogeneous gender norms for diagnosing ADHD. We have uh, rock curves for these data, and I'm just going to show these to you very quickly. These are diagnostic accuracy evaluations of teacher ratings for kids where, to simplify this chart, if you see uh, a solid line, that is the diagnostic accuracy line of those data uh, using the combined gender norms. The dashed line of the same color is the diagnostic accuracy of the same variable using homogeneous gender norms. And what you'll see is that the solid line is above the dashed line of the same color across the board. Some of the differences are larger than others. But at every point on the curve except the extremes, you will see that the combined gender norms are more accurate in diagnosis. At the extremes, they merge. But those are not the cases I'm worried about. These are the cases we get right no matter what. These are the most difficult cases to diagnose, and that's where the differences in the diagnostic efficacy of combined gender norms versus same gender norms is the greatest. And in every case, the combined gender norms are more accurate. We see that with parent ratings as well. We see it in adolescence, not just childhood, for both teachers and parents. So in summary, when we look at all these rock curves just for ADHD, in some cases the differences are small, but in every case at both age groups across parents and teachers, the combined gender norms were more accurate at that sweet spot of sensitivity and specificity for the most difficult cases to diagnose accurately. For extreme cases, it doesn't matter what norms you use, but these are the cases where we have the fewest and least difficult diagnostic problems. We're going to get those right. So fundamentally, our data tell us that combined gender norms preserve known and documented differences on key behavioral emotional constructs like anxiety and hyperactivity. They preserve known and accepted differences in prevalence rates of disorders known to differ as a function of gender, and they're more accurate overall. So we recommend clearly for accurate differential diagnosis combined gender norms. We can use and we provide you with other norm groups to answer other questions. But the research evidence is that for specific diagnoses, we want to use combined gender norms. And differential diagnosis is crucial to success. We've got to get the diagnosis right. Treatment of child and adolescent emotional and behavioral disorders is not one size fits all. If you do the same treatment or same intervention with every kid, no matter their diagnosis, you're going to fail more times than you succeed. So we've got to match those up. 
And children with emotional and behavior disorders deserve treatment, not just management. Just declaring a child eligible is not enough to guide treatment. We've got to get them to the right intervention and really avoid this idea of one size fits all. We don't want to end up being McDocs. If we match the diagnosis to the treatment, we'll be much more successful. Uh, once we figure out the problem, it's easier to find a solution, particularly one that works. The BAS-3 model gives you the guidance and the BAS-3 materials, the wherewithal to make accurate diagnoses of ADHD. You really don't need anything else if you use the entire set of materials. It's not just one test. The BAS-3 is a collection of assessment devices that are coordinated and co-normed. We have history and context, current behavior in multiple settings using multiple methods. We look at feelings, emotions, and self-perceptions, and we link to evidence-based interventions and monitoring forms. We have the behavior intervention guide, the flex monitor, and treatment fidelity forms so we can look at what we're doing. And it's important that we interpret test data in context. We have to have that history and context right. Remember, you would interpret this answer much differently on a war shock if you knew that it came from a flying insect. And I'm sorry, but uh, bugs and war shocks just seem to go together. So uh, the history and context are critical. And I've said that repeatedly. And uh, I'll try to stop belaboring that. But it's an area where perhaps we don't do as good a job as we could. We really need to understand the history and context of a child's life. Remember, um, that may look like lunch to you, particularly since we're doing this over many of you's lunch hour, but to a chicken, it's a horror movie. So understand the context of the person you're evaluating. And know who you're evaluating. Symptoms don't mean the same thing for everyone. Do not diagnose raccoons with insomnia because they stay up all night. We could go through and debate a proper diagnosis. Um, if you had, a, let's say, a nine-year-old who had every one of these symptoms, and what you would find is that every one of these symptoms is listed in some way in the DSM under all of these diagnostic conditions. The only way to differentiate these correctly is by history. So as I said, I'll try to stop belaboring this, but I, apparently I'm being unsuccessful. <laughs> so, um, we do also, in the BAS-3 Q Global reports, have diagnostic criteria that you can pull. And you just set this up on your menu screen for the reports. That'll do diagnostic matching, for example, for ADHD. Uh, when kids have items marked that are consistent with ADHD, these reports can uh, be pulled up routinely in your reports, and it'll match these to specific items and how it was responded to within the context of that. We have a license from the American Psychiatric Association to do this. They control all of the DSM um, content, and so you have to license that into your product from them. Uh, so that will help you as well. Additionally, in diagnosing ADHD, uh, we have probability indexes, and we include an ADHD probability index starting at age six. We have other probability indexes for specific diagnoses, but another one that's particularly crucial for ADHD is also the functional impairment index. Because remember that there must be some impairment in the child's daily life. And that's the functional impairment question. With regard to ADHD, the probability index says that children who present with elevated scores here experience problems that adversely affect academic performance, such as focusing and maintaining attention, inability to organize tasks effectively, decision-making problems, moderating their own activity level, 
And these center around the key diagnostic features of ADHD and discriminate at a high level between normal children and those with ADHD. Uh, it does not differentiate by subtype. Um, so it's not going to tell you if it's primarily inattentive or primarily hyperactive and impulsive. What it is going to discriminate is kids with ADHD from those who don't. And we have a study that we've just recently completed that will be out in uh, April looking at using these to also differentiate kids with autism from kids with ADHD, and it does a very, very good job with that as well. The functional impairment index indicates the level of difficulty a child has engaging in successful or appropriate behavior across a variety of interactions with others, performing age-appropriate tasks, regulating mood, doing schoolwork, the extent to which they basically interfere with daily functions of life and its enjoyment. So the functional impairment index is another one to consider carefully when you're considering the diagnosis of any clinical condition, but certainly ADHD. We have executive functioning indexes that are new to BAS-3 on the TRS and PRS, and ADHD kids typically perform very poorly on these. These are the problem-solving index, the attentional control index, behavioral control, and emotional control. We also give you an overall executive functioning index and this is the worst score of these kids on all of the content scales. So if we look at ADHD profiles on the BAS-3 from an actuarial standpoint, we see that their highest scores on school problems of the composite scales and their lowest scores on adaptive skills. So they're having a lot of functional impairment. On the clinical scales themselves, their highest scores in order are attention problems, hyperactivity and learning problems, their lowest score on somatization. As a group, they did not have any adaptive scores above 50, which is not a good thing. Their worst scores are on study skills and leadership. On the content scales, as I said, their executive functioning score is their worst, followed by emotional self-control, and unfortunately their resiliency score is not good. Um, and these are all by their teacher ratings. If we look at the parent ratings, you'll see remarkable similarity. There are high scores on externalizing problems. There is no school problem scale on the parent rating. Their low score, again, was on adaptive skills, and it's even lower than the teacher ratings. On the clinical scales, their high scores were on attention problems, hyperactivity, aggression, and conduct problems, and parents rated them all higher than teachers did. Their lowest score, same as teachers, somatization. Their adaptive skills were seen as worse at home than they are at school. They didn't have any adaptive scores above 45. And their lowest scores were on activities of daily living and leadership. Their worst score on the content scales was executive functioning, same as the teacher. But the parents see even more issues with anger control. And again, their worst score was on resiliency. If we look at the parenting relationship data, one of the things I thought you'd be interested in is that for ADHD kids, parents uh, give you the lowest scores on the parenting relationship questionnaire on attachment and on the involvement scales. Uh, and their highest uh, is on relational frustration. And these are uh, opposite, uh, oppositely scored or, or reverse scored. So they're not well attached to these kids, they're not as engaged in their life, and they are very frustrated about this. Um, so that will give you some idea how parents see their relationships on average with their kids with an ADHD diagnosis. So we want to link the interventions too, and what are effective interventions for ADHD? And it turns out medication is effective. There are multiple medications, primarily stimulants that work best, but they also have the greatest side effects. Um, there are some other uh, alternative medications, things like Stratera, uh, that are primarily noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. They're less effective, but have lower side effect profiles. Psychosocial interventions are effective. Behavioral and cognitive behavioral interventions are by far the most effective, but they have to target 
specific behaviors of the child in the context of their ADHD and is not a general one-size-fits-all, okay, we always do this behavior plan for kids with ADHD. They have to be individualized. Remember, one-size-fits-all doesn't work. Educational interventions, what's effective? Use a direct instruction model to teach learning and study skills, strategic listening, time management, and organizational techniques. These are things you can teach kids to do, and direct instruction models are clearly the most effective uh, in teaching these things to kids. The best intervention is all of the above. Uh, we've written about this extensively in the energetic brain. The multimodal intervention, which encompasses medical, psychosocial, and educational, is the way to approach ADHD. And I will emphasize this statement over and over and over. Medication alone should never be the intervention plan. It has to be accompanied by psychosocial and educational interventions. Some things that don't work, diet, by the way, uh, the fine gold diet, and this is a generous appraisal of it if you read this literature, is effective in less than 5% of cases of ADHD. Not 5% of the population. 5% of the population with a diagnosis of ADHD, uh, less than 5%, are helped by something like the fine gold diet. Food and vitamin supplements are not effective with the exception of omega-3 fatty acids from fish or krill, not from flax, are noted to have mild beneficial effects in high doses and are widely held to be safe. But the benefits are mild, but I've included them uh, to, as an exception because they do have some data to support them. I know of no other food or vitamin supplement that has double-blind placebo-controlled research studies that says it helps. Perceptual motor training programs like exercise programs, movement therapy, sensory integration therapy, those do not treat ADHD. If you have a kid who has coordination problems, and you want to treat their coordination problem, that's fine. But don't think it's going to treat their ADHD. Punishment paradigms. There are persons with ADHD are extremely resistant to punishment as a means of modifying behavior, except in the immediate presence of the punisher. There is no evidence of generalizability, and this generally just makes people angry and frustrates everybody when you use punishment paradigms as an attempted change agent in ADHD, they are some of the least effective means of approaching it. Sources for psychosocial and educational interventions, to be more specific, um, these are my three favorites, and you'll see my name on all three of them. And, uh, you know, I write about things that I think work and can document that work, and so I tend to go back to my, to my own summaries of that. One is The Energetic Brain, uh, our book on ADHD, on how to understand and management. Then the BAS-3 Behavior Intervention Guide, and those materials are also digitized, and you can get those materials into your Q Global report. Uh, and also for educational interventions, we've written a book uh, for that called Strategies for Academic Success. It's an instructional handbook for teaching students how to study, learn, take tests, it includes teaching things like strategic listening as well. Uh, so uh, how to organize uh, themselves, their life, managing time. These are all things that you can teach kids as educational interventions. The Behavior Intervention Guide is a detailed text and software guide that will link to specific interventions for ADHD. They're organized according to the assessment results across all of these categories and you'll see that hyperactivity and attention problems are included. And for most ADHD cases, you'll want to target attention and hyperactivity, but you'll want to pull out perhaps other domains based on the specific behavioral profile of the student. When we look at these, uh, if we went to the attention chapter, for example, uh, it would describe the characteristics and conditions of that and give you some theoretical framework for how attention problems development 
define and give examples. We give you an annotated bibliography of research that supports our interventions, how to prepare for implementing the intervention, how to actually do it on a step-by-step -step basis. Then we give you case examples and things to consider in the context of your environment that may be uh, require some change. So there will be multiple interventions for inattention. Uh, so you can choose the one that's most likely to work in your setting. But these are all documented to be effective with this population, and it can be done in schools. If there was no research saying it works in schools, we didn't include it. But there are multiple effective interventions for each, cla each class of behavioral and emotional issues. And so once we've linked you to the ones that are most likely to work, given the child's behavioral profile, you can narrow that down based on your knowledge of that school, that teacher, or that clinic, or whatever setting you're in, which one's most likely to be effective here and now. So for attention problems, these are the choices we would choose from and then let you narrow it down. We'll give you the two that are we think are most likely to work with this particular kid, but you can choose from all of these. Once you've chosen the one that you want to use, uh, for example, if you pick self-management, here's an example of what uh, the behavior intervention guide would tell you. It would describe it in some detail, give examples, tell you what the goals are, and the basic approach to it. Uh, that would be followed by steps, uh, step by step means of prepping to teach self-management and how to implement it, telling you exactly what to do. Uh, at each point, identifying, demonstrating, explaining, showing the child how to record and self-manage, uh, self how to demonstrate the techniques back to you, um, initiating the cueing process and prompting. So all of that's there in a step-by-step-by-step -step -step manner. And then we would discuss, for example, some of the considerations you might think about in teaching a child self-management techniques and how those might change with regard to the child's age and developmental level. And all that's covered in quite a bit of detail in each of these chapters where we can link you to the specific interventions based on the profile. So uh, we have the same thing for interventions for hyperactivity. Uh, we have a list of interventions at work, uh, and you would see that we also have self-management like we do with attention. but the specifics of teaching self-management for hyperactivity are actually quite a bit different than teaching it for inattention. So you would find then when you went through that that it was quite a bit different. But we would have all the same areas covered in detail. And one of the things we don't do and I don't recommend is even though ADHD is a disorder of self-regulation, I don't re recommend EF coaching. And the reason for that is that EF coaching doesn't generalize past the specific task used to teach it. Uh, EF is a method of the brain, and I, ha I have another whole hour and a half just on that that I'm not going to do because we only have about 15 minutes left. But what we do want to do is train the specific needed skills that kids have and enhance the knowledge base of the child's brain. So, for example, um, if we're going to do something about executive function in ADHD, we're going to avoid process training. We're going to train specific needed skills. And the way to approach that is something like this. If Johnny can't organize his study materials and figure out what to study in what sequence, is this an executive function problem? Uh, what do we do? Do we hire an EF coach? Do we train his sequencing skills? What do we do? Well, what we do is avoid cognitive process training and realize that what Johnny has is a problem learning to study. So we're going to teach Johnny study skills. We're going to attack the extant problem head on. So in that context, We're going to teach Johnny to develop associations with prior learning 
how to use self-talk when he studies, how to use concept maps, how to use multiple sources of information, how to improve his concentration when studying, and teach him means to improve his memorization skills rather than doing general EF coaching. If Louisa has trouble listening and attending to the teacher during class, is that an executive function problem? Or are we going to train processes for her? And my answer is always no. What we're going to do is teach Louisa specific strategic listening skills. We're going to teach her how to be an active listener, how to listen and recognize teacher cues when the teacher's talking, how to be prepared to listen, and how to manage and self-monitor her attention. So we're going to focus specifically on the skill deficits the child has. So there are many things teachers can do with this. Um, and remember, when we're mediating skill deficiencies, too, one size fits all doesn't work. So we're going to let the assessment process guide what we choose to target. And we're going to target skill problems, not process. Um, the best way to teach those uh, is to identify the skill deficit and attack it directly. Uh, strangely enough, the best remedial program for a child who can't read is to teach the child to read. Uh, the best remedial program for a child who uh, can't study is to teach them how to study. So identify the skill deficit. If they, if they can't attend in class, teach them to attend. So direct instruction models are the best way to do that. We also want to involve parents at every level, uh, including parents um, over and over. The research tells us, and there's some good summaries of this out there, increases treatment effects. So we have partnering with parents materials as part of BAS-3. We have them for attention problems, things that you can send home to the parent that explains it to them. These are tools for you to partner with them so they can understand what you're doing with their kid, but also how they can work with their own child and what kind of things they can do, how to talk to their child about their attention problems, giving them information about it, making them a well-armed parent, uh, and things that they can do. So these are all things that you can give parents that are available to you through the BAS-3 materials. We have our uh, refrigerator chart, we call it, that they can tear off of that parent tip sheet, put up on the refrigerator with a magnet, and they can note what they're doing at home, and they can send that back into you uh, once a week, once a month, every six weeks, whatever schedule you want to put them on. So these tip sheets exist in all areas of behavioral concern, and you can use them. Uh, the strategies for academic success I mentioned earlier, I'm just going to hit very quickly. It's an educational manual for teaching the educational interventions, uh, just like the, with the behavioral interventions. And uh, we have sections on how to teach all of these different aspects of this to kids, including listening skills, including self-management. Uh, so uh, it would allow us to teach study strategies, and we have specific scripted materials in that for you to do intervention. Every bit is detailed as the behavior intervention guide uh, to teach kids to overcome these academic skill deficits, which is what these are. Um, so we can teach concentration and attention strategies, and these are the areas we would focus on for teaching kids, and we have, again, scripted models for all of this. Uh, in the strategies for academic success materials. And we know that uh, the most effective way to do this is using direct instruction. Uh, and the direct instruction model is easy for you to locate. It's laid out in a great detail in strategies for academic success. But we also have to monitor intervention effects to see if kids are improving. Uh, to do that, we've developed the, the Flex Monitor as a component of the BAS-3. So you can customize behavior rating scales for the individual child. And then we will build that scale for you. And we're running out of time, so I can't go through in detail exactly how you do that. But we have some pre-existing forms that you can choose from, or you can literally create your own test. 
And then we will norm that test in the background for you almost instantly. It takes about two seconds. Um, you can go to the Flex Monitor section of Q Global. If you have a Q Global account, you have access to this already. You can filter through every item that's in the item pool, and there's about 800 items or so in there. And pick the items you'd like to have on your behavior rating scale for kids or your self-report. And you just simply click on those items over here, and it will move them over. Um, and I don't know what's happened. Uh, if the moderator can help me with this, that, uh, that screen has frozen. Um, so with the Flex Monitor, uh, it, the forms can be saved. You can share them with other users. Uh, the reliability data we'll provide to you based on the scale that you set up. And you'll be able to use that. You can print that. And again, my, uh, it has locked me out of controlling the slides, if you can move that slide. So uh, you really can create this monitoring program for yourself, the forms uh, you create use heavily vetted, validated items with known characteristics and content relevance. Uh, you'll know all the psychometric properties of the scale you build for this unique child. So uh, that's there for you. Uh, we can give you a lot more information about that and how to use it, but it's a great way to monitor change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also have um, uh, forms available that uh, will allow you to monitor treatment fidelity. And the behavior intervention guide and the behavioral issues uh, materials that we have include a documentation, a documentation checklist that will allow you to determine whether or not people are delivering the interventions as described. And that is very important. You don't know if what you're doing isn't working, if it isn't working, because it's not being delivered properly or maybe we chose the wrong intervention. So one of the things that uh, we have to do is monitor treatment fidelity in some objective, uh, objective means. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. We've got about five minutes left. Um, if there are some specific questions that the, uh, uh, that the monitor has you want me to address in the next uh, five minutes, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Well, I actually do have a couple that I haven't been able to answer, so thank you, and thank you very much for the presentation okay. thus far. It's always great information. Um, people are, have been asking good questions. Here's a question about the variability that exists among states with regard to school psychologists' ability to diagnose students with ADHD, uh, depending on if a medical diagnosis is already present. So I think the question is, any insight or thoughts on that issue and on um, school psychologists when using things like the BASC, should they be able to diagnose ADHD in schools without a, without a medical diagnosis? Well. I think they should, uh, but that you know, but uh, it, states have different laws, and some states allow school psychologists to make that diagnosis, and some don't. And the answer is you have to follow the laws of the state you live in. Uh, I, I, if you're a school psychologist, I think your training should have qualified you to make these kinds of diagnoses. It's no different than diagnosing depression or an anxiety disorder. Uh, things that we routinely have to diagnose with kids. So um, it's important to do that. And you should be well trained in doing that. But you ultimately have to follow the laws and regulations of the state that you live in. So you have to know those. Um, if they prohibit you specifically from doing it, don't do it. But I think school psychologists should be qualified to do that, and it should be part of your training. Thank you. Another person asked um, what your thoughts are on the comorbidities of inattentive behaviors and ADHD and memory dysfunctions. 
Well, uh, memory problems are uh, a common uh, occurrence, uh, or should we say poor performance on memory tests is a common occurrence. Uh, you can't have memory without an attentional track being laid. So if a kid isn't paying attention, you need to be able to differentiate whether it's an attention problem or a memory problem. And uh, that is going to require formal memory testing as well as the behavioral assessments that are done. But it's common for kids with ADHD to have poor performance on memory scales because they're not paying attention and they're distracted and they're moving around and they're going to miss something that's important uh, to establishing that memory trace. So poor performance on memory scores is quite common, uh, but it's not necessarily diagnose, uh, diagnostic of ADHD. Um, it is a, in many of those kids, it's a result of the ADHD. Thank you. And one more on uh, a rough percentage. Do you have any idea what percentage of kids with ADHD are responsive to medical intervention? I'm assuming that that's medication. I think it was around the time when you were talking about um, you mm -hmm. know things that have worked. Yeah. Well, it depends on which specific medication is being used. Um, uh, you know, Ritalin uh, probably close to 80% of kids treated with Ritalin are going to have a positive response to it, but it's not enough. And I'll say that over and over and over. Um, medication alone is not a proper intervention for ADHD. Medication plus psychosocial interventions and educational interventions is the proper plan. Um, uh, medication has a role to play but never by itself. Okay. I just have one other unanswered question, um, and that it has to do with um, you talked a little bit about the effects of diet or the lack of effect of diet change on ADHD mm -hmm. uh, in the literature. So someone around that time asked also if you had any thoughts about the effect of artificial food diets and how eliminating them from diets might improve behavior. Well, the, the effects of artificial food, di food dyes is an allergic reaction, and kids can be specifically tested for that. And if they're not allergic to the specific food dye uh, that you think is causing that, then the food dye is not causing it. And um, allergy clinics can test for that. Um, it's not hugely expensive. Uh, it's uh, very inconvenient, and kids don't necessarily like going through it but they can be tested for those allergies, but it's an allergic reaction. Uh, it's not um, something where it's causing some uh, systemic defect to occur. It's very much uh, an allergy to, to that food dye, and just like kids have an allergy to peanuts. Um, and the allergic response um, uh, to one or two of the food dyes that are out there in a very, very, very small number of kids um, is uh, this agitation that can be misdiagnosed as ADHD. But it's unusual, but there are a very small number of kids who have an allergic reaction to that. In fact, the Feingold diet was designed to eliminate an allergic reaction to normally occurring salicylates uh, in foods. And uh, and for the kids that the Feingold diet works for, they are actually having an allergic reaction to uh, foods that are that contain salicylate. So uh, there's a very small number of kids out there for whom that's an issue, but they can also be tested for that. All righty, thank you so so much. Uh, it is 1:32. So we are going to have to end. A few okay. questions are still coming in. I've put my email in the chat box. So if if you have an unanswered question you'd like for Dr. Reynolds to respond to, please send it to me, and I will get with him, and we'll get you a response. Um, thank you all very much.